Morning, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here doing this morning's webcast, updating our momentum portfolio for what's our first quarter, uh, March to May, which is three months. So we're going to do a, a quick recap of what the momentum portfolio is. We'll touch on the top 40 and mid cap for March 15. We'll look at the June 15 and we'll look at a, a new one, which I'm busy tweaking and, and playing with that would fit into tax-free savings accounts. Um, the, 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 the June 15, what we're going to be doing is essentially a full portfolio every quarter. So there's the March one, which we call March 15, which we're currently in. We'll then do a June 15, a September 15, and a December 15. And the logic behind the extra portfolios is for folks who come in late. If you come in late, you can always just jump in whenever you want. But what we're saying here is, well, if you come in late and you kind of, you know, week or two ago, well, he has the portfolio to get into on the 1st of June, which is Monday tomorrow. Um, and we will track them and, and run with them. We're not putting cash into them. Our cash is in the March one. There will be different returns across those four portfolios, of course. But in theory, over time, they will even out. And uh, we've got a, a deal coming with the broker, but that will only kick in uh, starting in the September one. Uh, so what is momentum? It's a concept that says that trends tend to continue for a heck lot longer than we ever anticipate and that we select stocks for this portfolio based purely on share price movement, including dividends. So in essence, a total return. So what we do is we, we go and scan stocks over the previous 12 months on percentage return. We add in dividend and we buy the winner. As simple as that. No more, no less than that. So we keep it really, really simple. We then hold those stocks for a year. So in the top 40, we uh, buy five stocks. In the mid cap, we buy six stocks, benchmarks respectively, Satrix 40 and RMB mid cap, which is top 40 and the mid cap uh, 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 index. We use those two, however, because the logic being that they are tradable, they pay dividends so that they're real in a sense. They have uh, expenses within, within them, total expense ratio. It's not unfair. Uh, so does our portfolios have expenses as we transact. So it gives us a real portfolio that we can we can track and a benchmark that we can then measure ourselves against, which is critically important in that sense. We are pondering, and I'm going to give it thought, and we'll make a decision by September as to whether we should merge mid cap and top 40. And there are a couple of reasons behind it. Uh, uh, sim just to simplify the process, um, also because your mid cap is going to give you a better return in the good years. It's going to give you a worse return in the bad years, and in theory, that will then smooth that process out a whole lot more. All things being equal. Uh, if you've got thoughts, let me know. And, and we'll always, you know, we might merge the two portfolios, but they will always be the top 40 stocks and the mid cap stocks. So in essence, you would be able to uh, uh, pull them apart if you only wanted to invest in one or the other. But if you've got thoughts, uh, drop me a tweet at SimonPB, email me simon at justonelap.com. So we hold them for a year. Our calendar year is 1 March to 28 Feb. For example, the June 15 one we do now will be 1 June to 31 May. We then do a 1 September to 31 August and a 1 December to 30 November. So there will ultimately be four. We do a monthly update of all of the portfolio returns. Uh, the link is at the bottom of the page there, blog.justonelap.com. The latest one went up uh, yesterday, 30 May, and at the end of every month, we will do a full update of each of the portfolios. So there's just the funding. We started with 50,000 at the beginning of 2013. We added 20,000 uh, last year, and we added another 30,000 in March of this year. So we're funded with 100,000 per portfolio. So 200,000 cash. And this is the point. These are real live portfolios. They've both been funded with 100,000. We will add again uh, in March of 2016. Um, and until at such point, we say, well, we've probably got a portfolio. Yeah. At some point, we might stop adding, although I'm not sure one ever does really. There's always money flowing. And I've always got money to allocate to to my trading, to my ETFs, to my uh, uh, death to us part stocks, and of course, to my trading systems, which is the momentum and the lazy systems. Those were the stocks for the top 40, um, Mr. Price, MediClinic, Netcare, RMI, and First Rand, Discovery, and Aspen were just not making the cut. They were number six and seven, respectively. Um, Discovery is the one we would have liked, rather. Uh, Aspen, well, at this point, we're happy we didn't get it. So those were the five stocks, and there's their performance thus far. Um, 
Question coming from Peter. Does that mean 11 stocks in top 40, for instance? Peter, it would be 11 stocks in top 100, if, and we're talking about the merged process. So top 40 and mid-cap is ultimately the top 100 stocks, and that would mean 11 from those uh, 100 best stocks. And maybe we go with 10, maybe it's 12. I've got to work out that math around the equation. But yeah, it would be a, 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 all the stocks in one pot out of the top, top 100. But we would separate it still. So we would pick five from the top 40, and then we would pick six or five or whatever the case may be from the mid cap. So it wouldn't just be the best 11 stocks in the top 100. Uh, we still want that, that weighting between mid cap and top 40. So here's our top 40 March 15 portfolio uh, in a nutshell. Horrible. Uh, down 8.2. That's not complete. Yep. Not completely correct because there's cash sitting down at the bottom there. We come to the exact numbers in a moment. But we're getting killed left, right, and center. Uh, nothing is green here. We've got leading the way down is MediClinic, followed cotton the heels by Mr. Price. Then we've got Netcare, RMI, and FSR bringing up the rear in a sense. We have had some uh, cash coming in um, in terms of dividends from those stocks. But thus far, it's been a, a tough time, a particularly tough Friday, down 1.8%. But you know, it happens. Uh, we had 128,000 at the beginning of the, at, at March, almost 129. We're down to 118,000. The mid cap, those were the six stocks, Fortress B, Telcom, which we held over from the previous year, uh, Capitec, Pioneer, the Fashini Group, and Resilient. Brayton AVI just popped out. Uh, Capitec is flagged because I hold it in my long-term portfolio as well. In the top 40 space, I don't hold any of those stocks in long term. And the other stocks in this portfolio here, I also don't hold long term. And there they are. This number is skewed by Telcom because the purchase price is from uh, March 2014, not March 2015. I had bought in 2014. We held them for the year and in 2015, I then actually sold them down to get them to that correct weighting. But we've got some winners here. We've got Capitec looking pretty up 21%. Uh, Fortress B down 11.5, massively illiquid stock. Um, Pioneer up 13.6, Resilience slightly down, Fashini Group slightly down, and Telcom reflecting a huge profit, but actually in the red. And I'll show you exact numbers for that in a moment. So there are the portfolio returns excluding costs. So mid-cap momentum up 0.9% in total, different from the number we're seeing there, which shows 11.9, but that's because of the skew from Telcom. So mid-cap's up 0.9 after costs, the benchmark down 3.5, top 40 down 7.7% after costs, and the benchmark down 1.3. So we're getting killed on the top 40, uh, and we... Well, we're ahead on the on, on the on the mid cap. The point is, and it's an important distinction. What we're looking for is to beat our benchmark. So, in fact, if our mid cap momentum was minus two, we would be ahead of the benchmark and would be, in theory, smiling. Uh, so, but we're happy with that. We're ahead of the game. Down here, we're not. Uh, top 40 momentum is getting slaughtered. It's only first quarter, and it's not the first time that I've seen it happen where at a certain point, usually sometimes first or second quarter, we are we are behind the curve sometimes by a lot, uh, and then we catch up as the rest of the year carries on. There's it represented uh, graphically, and my colors are not as I'd hoped. So the yellow at the top, so what I've got is we all started at 0% on 1st of March. 1st of April, we had mid-cap, which is the yellow, up 88 1st of May, up 9.4. May was a horror month. We ended the year, month at 09 uh, The benchmark which is that uh, sort of light green was at 0 0.6. So we will well outperform 1.9, well outperform 3.5, not so good. The top 41 started all right, was up 1.3, benchmark was minus 0.8. Uh, then it swung, benchmark went 3.1, we went to 1%, and now benchmark is minus 1.3, and we are minus 7.7. .7. So looking ugly in that sense there. The question is, and I'll hit it now, am I stressing? Nah. Am I losing money in behind, the, in behind the benchmark? Yep. Do I like that? No. But two things. Firstly, we are one quarter into a year, so we are a quarter of the way. Um, so you know, this is an early day in the process. We've got nine more months. Of course, in those nine months, we could do significantly worse, and we could end up even worse behind the benchmark, or we could do some recovery from the process. As I said, I've 
often seen, particularly after Q1, sometimes after Q2, where we are badly behind the curve and we recoup. And I remember holding NASPAS last year, which at one point was down 20 odd percent on us and then recovered and ended the year up nicely. Uh, Breit as well last year was, was, was badly down underwater and recovered the year nicely. Grinrod last year was underwater and remained so pretty much the whole year. The other point is we don't expect to win and beat the benchmark every year. We expect to beat it three out of four years. And that's an important distinction. We will, one in four years, underperform our benchmark. And there's a couple of reasons behind it. Firstly, you're never going to get 10 for 10. More than that is that, I mean, from a sense, you're going to get what we see rebalancing. So at one point, resources have been under the cosh now for years and years. It's been about industrial stocks. And this year, we've got a lot of property, uh, medical and financials. And at some point, you get that transition from one sector to another. And the year that happens, so the year that resources start their bull run, and I don't think it's happened yet, but it will happen at one point. The year resources start their bull run, we will underperform because resources will do great and we wouldn't be holding any. But then immediately the next year, of course, we will jump into it. And those trends, you know, the industrial has been the winning sector for years, five, six, seven years. Banks are coming into their party last year as well. Resources have been underperforming for years and years. They will have their day in the sun. So there's the portfolios. Initial funding with 50,000 each in Jan 13. Um, and I run a unitized process. And you can go and find the URL down at the bottom. And I update that uh, file with the latest one. Um, so if you go to that URL, you can you can download the, the, the Excel. So it's not a straight, we had 50, we had 100, you know, we, or we added 100. Because it's 100 in total that we put in. We started with 50. Remember, we've added money over time to take it to 100. But it's, it's weighted average cost of money in, in essence. So we unitized the process. So top 40, since one since 2 Jan is up 34.7. And the top 40 index up 33%. So, okay, there's no costs in that 33%. But let's put some costs in and take it down to, I don't know, 30, 28. We're winning after costs, but not after tax. Tax is killing us. On the mid-cap momentum, we're well ahead, 106. If we take some costs out of the mid-cap index, um, let's say we'd go down to, I don't know, 28%. Man, we take tax out of there, we're still double what the mid-cap index has done uh, over the same period. And that's an important point. We need to be double because when the bad years come, it is going to hurt. So the collective value of the portfolios, uh, what are we, about 280-odd thousand, uh, 280,000 and some change. You can check, so there's the 28 Feb, that's where we started this particular portfolio year, uh, and you can tell, as, we, as per the previous slide there, uh, my top 40 is slightly down and my mid cap is slightly up. And when I say, well, slightly down, no, we're down a lot, 7 odd percent. We're slightly up, uh, yeah, we are up a, a fraction of a percent. We've made a, a grand 1,400 4, rand over that period. So stop loss. And I've had a bunch of emails from folks, particularly around Mediclinic, particularly around Fashini. Last year it was around Grinrod. What do we do with stop loss? And the short answer is we don't. And I have looked at it at 100 different ways, and I've never found a way that gives me a methodology of stop loss that actually gives me a better return. And here's, since here, here's your risk. So the stock just goes down and down and down and down and down and that's totally horrible and if we then stopped at say five percent or 10 or 15 or 20 or or 25 we're better off for it but what happens when the stock goes down 20 percent 22 and then goes up again and we lock in that minus 22 and i must stress that you know if you're using stop loss in a trading space with derivatives different kettle of fish this is peculiar to the momentum portfolio what i find with stop loss is that wherever i put it if i put it at five percent ten or at 15 or at 20 more often than not more than half of the time the stock will fall a percentage and then run again and it might just get to break even it might actually get into some nice profit the point being is that if you stop at some point what you're doing is essence you're locking in that loss and because I'm not on a derivative, it's not a stress. There's no pain in the process. It's not a problem. You know, if you're in a derivative, you need to stop that bleeding at some point very quickly. The methodology here is hold for a year. If I take stop losses at any point in the process, it actually reduces my return. So I might say, let's take a 10% stop loss. Um, and in this case, okay, so we reduced our return because the stock recovered. But we take it and we go put it into another stock. And then there's a risk that that stock goes. It just, bottom line is, I haven't found a way 
where using a stop loss on this portfolio actually enhances return. I have one exception, and that is corporate action. So if a company goes into, into uh, liquidation, although in truth, I would never in theory be holding such a company, um, and if it, you know, but, but if it does, I would, I would uh, 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 certainly expect to action it. So in corporate actions, I will make a decision. Peter, you ask, it seems that the mid-caps do better. Have you over the years found they do worse than top 40? So mid-caps, on a year-by-year basis, mid-cap nearly always beats top 40. And in truth, you expect that. The mid-cap as an index does better than the top 40, although not by much, because understand there's two things happening in the mid-cap. And the one, you've got the rising stocks, the new stars that come in from small to mid, and they're rising and they move up the index. And then like Capitec, they pop into the top 40 index, in fact. Um, but on the other side, you've got the falling stocks. So you've got those stocks that fall out of the top 40. Marion Roberts. In 2007, 8, Marion Roberts was in the top 40. Over time, it fell into the mid cap. Now it's fallen into the small cap. So what it did was it was dragging it down. So in the mid cap, you've got a, a collection of the rises moving up and the fall is going down. And you still do better than top 40, but not by as much. Because we pick the winners, we do significantly better. That all said, is in the bad years, 2008, your mid cap gets collapsed. It just gets slaughtered. So you get these really, really good years. And if we take it over a complete cycle, in other words, the good and the bad years, the mid cap still beats top 40, still beats its index, still a great place to be, but that bad year is bad. So it also depends. I mean, if you started on the first bad year, it would be massively painful. We started with 13 and 14, both being great years. 15, well, we're ahead, but the jury's out. Um, but broadly over time, uh, mid cap should do better than top 40. Although, as I said, you know, there's a skewness and then it looks like, you know, some years everything's lacquer and then it goes sort of pear-shaped in a sense. So let's haul up my screen and uh, get stocks for the 2015 process. So that is the top 40 daily chart we're looking at there. Nine red days in a row. First time we have had nine red days in a row since uh, uh, 1998. In truth, it's only about 5% down. What we are seeing is, is lower highs and lower lows. But if you look at the stocks, it's actually not looking that massively weak. But that's not a pretty chart by any way we stretch it. Um, and that's certainly what has hurt us. If you look at the mid-cap chart, mid-cap chart not maybe as ugly, although we're going uh, lower highs, lower lows. Um, interestingly, if we switch it to weekly, which is now my lazy system, we got stopped out of our lazy system on Friday. The stop is there. Ironically, we actually had a buy signal. So if we had closed the week green, we would have been adding to our position. Instead, we've got a massive reversal and we've actually exited our position. But let's go and haul up the stocks. It's a quick view. Uh, to We don't take 31 May. We need to take our last trading day, which was 29 May. We say, give me uh, yearly returns. We filter on top 40. So I've got a watch list that exists with an AMI broker of those stocks. And we say, boom. So NASPAS, Mondi, Mr. Price, Netcare, Discovery, um, and then Aspen. Aspen at 31.24. So if Aspen had a massive bone and massive dividend, or if Capco had a massive dividend, or First Rand had a massive dividend, that could add to the equation. So let's quickly check what those dividend yields are, because that's an important part of the process. We do a total return. We need to include dividend in that process. Peter, where would I put the support line? I'm, are you talking top 40? I'll come back to that. Short answer is I don't do support lines. I just I don't I don't subscribe to them, to be perfectly honest. Um, so what are we looking for? We let's check what. Uh, sorry, I've got too many keyboards here, and I keep on going to the wrong one. So discoveries, and I'm going to do roughish rule of thumb. So discoveries dividend yield is 1.1. We have ourselves a 38, so it pushes it up to 34%. Um, I can't imagine that any of the guys are going to get that. So I need to get like 3.5% from First Rand, Capco, or Aspen. Let's see what they are. First Rand might be the one. Nope, 3.1 doesn't crack it. Uh, Capco, I can't imagine they're giving us a great dividend. 0.3. And then Aspen. Uh, I know that Aspen is a is a very modest dividend payer. And in fact, I don't pay dividends, so I'm going to get zero. But if I go to dividend history, 
So they pay share premium, two bucks, call it. So no. So short answer, uh, the stocks coming in, therefore, are Naspas, Mondi. Do you take Limited or PLC? You take whichever gives you a slightly better entry point. Mr. Price, Netcare and Discovery, two, four, five. Those are your stocks. Let me add them in. Naspas is back. I'm going to put uh, NDP, but it, MDP or uh, what is Mondi's other one? MDP? MD, is it MDL? Ah, the other Mondi. Um, MPC, NTC, and DSY. So those are the five stocks. We have MPC and NTC. So we hold two of them. Now, some folks might say, well, okay, let's sell and keep those two and add the other three. Sure, I worry about costs. It's not the process that I've done. I don't rebalance on a quarterly basis. I balance on an annual basis. Next, go to mid caps. So mid cap. Two, four, six takes us down to COP Agri. Sorry, just COP these days. As our six stocks, we've got Fortress Bees, which we hold, Capitex, which we hold, Braid, EOH, Nepi, and COP. AVI, I'm not going to stress it because AVI is almost 10% behind. So there's no chance that AVI is going to catch up. So my six mid cap stocks are FBB, CPI, B. A T E O H N E P and K A P. So those are the stocks that sit there as that, uh, and 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 the six that would go in again. We hold FBB and CPI. We don't hold the others. Some folks will say, why don't you rebalance? Rebalance has never been part of our process. But what we've done here is that if you are looking to, to, to uh, um, ah, I know, Mondi, it's NNP and MN, NND. No, what is my Mondi codes? I can't, sorry, folks, my mind has gone completely blank and I can't remember the Mondi codes. Um, what we've done here is essentially saying that if you didn't get the March 15 and you want to jump into the portfolio from June, from June, uh, 1st of June, which is Monday, 1 June, opening auction, those are the 11 stocks across the two portfolios. As I said, we will track it. We will update it. We do a update every uh, month end. There is the update we did yesterday. So we just look at the portfolio. No, that's not yesterday's one. Yesterday's one is there. So we look at the portfolio returns. We're obviously going to start adding the June one into this at the same time. We look at the particular stocks, and then we've got cash in these two portfolios at the same time. So now we'll be tracking a March 15 and a June 15 portfolio. That's something I want to, I'm, I'm looking at. So what about doing this but using ETFs? So why would we use ETFs? So same process. Why would you use ETFs? Tax-free savings accounts. Remember earlier, when I look at that one slide, where top 40 is doing, frankly, uh, nice but not nice enough when we take tax into account. So how do we manage that? Well, why don't we trade in a tax-free environment? So we're looking at funds and stuff, and that's just been a, a massively painful process, which has taken us, got us nowhere thus far. But what if we could do this in a tax-free savings account? Now, we cannot trade shares in a tax-free savings account, but we can trade ETFs. Not all of them, but 38 of them that we can trade. But uh, certainly, we could put some ETFs in. So what have we got here? So I must stress two things. Firstly, this is not a full list of the ETFs. I had a, a system crash. I had to recreate it this morning, and I lost some data in the ETF space. So these are not all of the ETFs. Um, and some of them, for example, new USD is not applicable. It's not allowed to be in there. New gold is not. African palladium is not. Um, new palladium is not. But in essence, what we would go and do is buy Deutsche Bank Japan, US World, G-Trax, and the Momentum one from Absa. And those would be, so instead of doing stocks, we go and do the five best performing ETFs that sit within that universe of 38 ETFs that we can trade. And we do it within a tax-free trading account. 
and suddenly the game is different. Now, the short answer at this point, because we're only in, one, in year one of the tax-free savings account, we've only been able to put 30,000 in there. But in time, next year, we put another 30, and now we're up to 60. By year, by, by March of 2017, we've got, say, 100,000 in there. We've put 30,000 three times. We've got 10,000 from the, the profits we've made. Now we can actually start to do this. A, costs are minute. I mean, my broker, if I'm doing 20,000 Rand transactions, say we pick five ETFs, I'm doing 20,000 Rand transactions because we've got 100,000 in there. My cost on a 20,000 Rand transaction is, is, is nothing. As a percentage, it's about 0.32, all inclusive. So nice and cheap, uh, no tax on the profits. So there's actually a lot to be said. So it's not a plan for now because one could do it with the 30,000, I suppose. We could do 6,000 each. The costs are so cheap. Frankly, it still works. Um, so, But this is my, my thinking and my cunning plan for going forward that actually we'll roll a ETF momentum portfolio, trading the ETFs that are applicable, and we will do it within a tax-free savings account. So recap. The, po the concept is you buy the winners because trends tend to continue for longer than we ever imagined that they will. Uh, we're going to update quarterly. So this was our, our June 15 quarter. We've introduced the second portfolio, which is June 15. Uh, and then it will update again in September. And when I say update, we do the webcast. And that webcast will be done. So the September webcast will be done on the evening of 31 August, which is a Monday. We're doing this on a Sunday, and the second time we've done it on a Sunday, simply because the Friday is the close of the quarter or the month and Monday, and I, I'm not going to do a webcast on Friday evening. No one's going to come. Hey, I'm not going to come for it. Um, but we'll do the next one will be 31 August, where we will then update the March and June portfolios and introduce the September portfolio. And we've got a deal coming with a particular stockbroker around giving us some discount rates on these portfolios as well. What we will continue to do, however, is we do the, the updates on Twitter and Facebook, um, and we also do that, oh, we do the other update, which I just showed you on blog.justonelap.com. The Twitter and Facebook are ad hoc. The blog.justonelap.com we do on the last day of every month. So there will be an update at the end of June, on the 30th, end of July, 31st, and then, of course, along with August as well. So we're going to be coming at this from a dozen, dozen different directions. If I can request from you folks, if you've got, Comments and thoughts. If you've got comments and thoughts around the multiple portfolios, if it's confusing you, give me a shout. Uh, if the updates confuse you, give me a shout. If they think there's something I should be adding or something I could be subtracting, if you've got thoughts, let me know. Uh, Simon at justonelap.com or tweet me at Simon PB. But certainly more than happy to, 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 I'm always happy to discuss things. I'm not for a second saying that it's my way or the highway. Peter, ETF momentum will also be annually in the TFSA. Yeah, I, I, I need to crunch some numbers. I need to roll it in, around in my head. But my sense is yes, although, so the point is, is, is why don't I do rebalancing on a quarterly basis? And there, there are two reasons. Um, well, they're, 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 okay, so there are two. One is, is costs. It suddenly means instead of incurring, so say my costs in total, let's say are 2%. 1% on the buy and 1% when I sell. They're actually lower, but let's say it's that. Um, suddenly, if I rebalance, so I get 2% costs on a year. If, if I rebalance quarterly, I've got 8% costs in a year because I'm doing it every quarter, I incur those costs. Now, that's not quite true because my costs are 2% and because I wouldn't necessarily rebalance every stock. But you see the point. Let's say it, it's 5% instead of 1.6. It certainly adds to the costs. Um, tax implication as well, because I'm going to be selling a stock uh, when it runs and I'm going to be getting a lot more taxable events in a sense. So those both hurt. Both of those are relatively moot in a TFSA. There's no tax and my costs are massively tiny. So I need to go back and revisit and have a look at it. But my gut says it will be annual as well. You know why? Because I'm lazy, in truth. Uh, Marvin, what happened to the idea of a CFD version of the portfolio? So Marvin, it's a great point. And, and, and it's really, really quite simple. I run the numbers and I take some worst case scenarios. And what the plan was to, to, to not over gear. So only to gear at around two or three times, and probably at three times. It currently puts my top 41 down 20-odd uh, percent, and I've also uh, incurred costs in terms of the, the holding period. When I run those numbers on the CFD account, at some point, we always bust out. There's always a point, unless I pull gearing down to about one and a half or so. But if I'm running gearing at three, at some point, we always bust out. Might be years away, but it always happens. 
Uh, Gerardus, what about Easy Trader, low cost platform? Uh, sure, Easy Trader would. Sorry. Yeah, Easy Trader, um, the Purple Capital platform. Easy Trader would certainly make it more attractive because of transaction fees um, and because of no admin. The admin's moot. I already have the admin, so that doesn't hurt me. I'm not paying any extra for it. Um, I'm paying 0.5 Easy Equities as 0.25 uh, and no minimum. So if you've got a small portfolio, certainly Easy Equities would be a place to look at doing it there. So short answer, yeah, Easy Equities. Folks, I'm not seeing any questions coming through, so we will park it there for now. Uh, video will be up this afternoon. Uh, question to look back at the stock. So those are those are the shares for the, Ju for the June 15 portfolio. If you've missed it and you want to jump in, you would go in and enter now. Question coming through. If the market's looking weak, should I be entering? To my mind, to me, it's simple. I've got rules. So let's say I was a June entry rather than March, and I was sitting today with my 280-odd thousand, and I was going to put it into the market. Would I do it on Monday, i.e. tomorrow, notwithstanding those trend lines in the week-looking chart? Yes, I would. I absolutely would. Why? Because my momentum system doesn't say we buy, but if the market's looking weak. I'm bringing more things into it. And there could be an argument for saying you could you could introduce that rule. But as I said, I don't have that rule. For me, it's not a rule there. It's not something I'm particularly worried about. Certainly, it could get nasty. You now, if you buy tomorrow and we go down another, perhaps as much as 10%, you're going to be under some water. Momentum stocks might get hit harder. But for me, it's a case of the rules say you buy, you get in, you hold the process. And I remember with my portfolio, which was the 2014 March portfolio, uh, Brait was looking particularly weak. And oddly enough, we looked through the charts of the 11 stocks, and Brait was the one I said, you know what, if I was bringing weakness into the process, and weakness is subjective, right? we have to accept that, but you know, if I was bringing weakness, and even if I used moving averages or something, Brait was the one stock I wouldn't have bought last year, and it was my one of my best performing at the end of the day. In March of last year, go, go back and look at the chart. Brait was looking immensely weak, and yet it recovered. So if I was looking for June 15, I would buy tomorrow. Look, you can say, hey, let's go in and wait a, 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 a two weeks and wait for it to flush out. That's fine. Up to you. Uh, yeah, stocks. Uh, Crano, the stocks have equal weighting. So in the top 40, it's 20% of stock um, because there are five of them in the mid cap. It is... Um, 15-ish, 16% per stock. So I just put them absolute equal weighting, each stock equal weighting into it. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. We will park it there. Uh, thanks for your time on the Sunday morning. We can go back to watching the uh, comrades runners who haven't yet made it to Maritzburg. And well, we know who aren't the runners. That's us in the, in, in the webcast here. Uh, ladies and gents, thanks for your time. You have a great day all further. Cheers all.